focus on all these projects you and we are working on the city. Great, thank you. Um, so thanks, y'all. Uh, great to be here. Um, I apologize in advance. The water plan team, I'll talk about that. They are here this week, and we're up at the Rosemont Pavilion. Spent a little bit in a few minutes, but they are meeting with folks from Rosemont and Lamsey to scope out the Rosemont Pavilion spent work, and that's going on at 11 upstairs. So I, I will run from this to that. And I Katie's gotten covered, if there's any questions, so we're good. Um, so I just want to give you a, a few updates of things that have been going on um, with all of us. Um, so touch dialogues, you know, talk about fill in the floodplain and how it's detrimental for it disperses water elsewhere, it displaces water, causes flooding elsewhere. It's not the same fill, the fill is not the same soil type as what um, is natural. It, it, it's not good. So there are a lot of reasons to restrict these fill lying areas, touch dialogues with teams that you know let's really work on and make recommendations to do this. Um, the stormwater department over the uh, after touch dialogues was working with um, the home builders and others to try to move that forward. Um, stormwater is really really busy. They just have too much on their plate. So last summer, last spring, I took that on on the, into our office and um, we decided to convene the home builders, the realtors, the Metro Chamber of Commerce, the environmental organizations League, a law center, Brock Charleston Foundation. We worked together to get a joint recommendation to council, like what could we do here? And we, we you know, we consider a lot of different things. Um, and so it is a pretty important effort, and we made a consensus recommend, recommendation to city council um, last November to say, okay, let's ban slab on grade in the hundred year flood plain because slab on grade is the use of slabs. Right, is what is bringing the fill in. You can't ban fill completely because you have to build roads for public safety reasons to certain height, and that may require elevation. So let's go after the, the proximate cause, which is slab. So we made a recommendation to council to ban um, uh, slab on grade within the 100 year floodplain at some point in the future um, for new residential development. For new multifamily residential development, and when you would have a moment where there's a substantial improvement or redevelopment, so a house is being rebuilt, the property is being renovated, that if you would change the foundation of that property, then you'll have to comply with the new requirements. And if you leave the house there because it burned down, and you're just going to rebuild what was, you would not. And this addresses some of the concerns that members of council in the past have expressed about. You know, if someone's house burns down, why are we forcing them to elevate their, their um, foundation for a flood? So this is a way to do that. Um, the map here shows you, uh, you know, we know exactly where our 100 year floodplain is. It is mapped. It is uh, the builders, developers, they know where this is. We know how to manage it. Manage it. We suggested a change or addition to the um, stormwater design standard manual um, for the permitting process, and that's how the builders would then have to comply with it. Um, developers and um, City Legal uh, Corporation Council now has some suggestions from Matt Thompson, Stormwater, and myself of how that can be done. We anticipate that that will come to Public Works Committee and City Council in March. Hopefully, we can move this on. And one of the things we work on, and um, home builders and realtors and the sort of the business community, they're on board with this is okay, after a transition period allowing this thing to go into force. To review and see what kind of surprises there were with the implementation of this. Was it easier than thought? Was it harder than thought? Were there some complications with you know the permitting process? Do a look back on that so that's important to get more efficiency, but also to see if we can extend this in the future to the five hundred year plan. So banning the use of fill for residential development in the five hundred year plan. If we could get that far in the next couple of years, that's really good. So um yeah. Sure. Okay, this is not advancing. Can you advance it? Can you move it, please? Green problem. There it is. So, again, this is a recommendation. We would use existing FEMA um, documents to say this is accepted in the 100 year floodplain and this is not accepted in the 100 year floodplain for development. So, a lot of people will see if we can do this, and this is, this is really good progress, we think, on this important issue. 
So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the mayor uh, talked about when he started. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we went through a feasibility process, which is part of a larger coastal storm risk management process at the Army Corps of Engineers. It took three years and eight months. Um, when we completed that last summer, Congress got a hold of that recommendation from the Army Corps of Engineers, and they approved the authorization for the city and the Army Corps to move into the next phase of the process, which is pre-construction engineering design and construction. So design comes before construction, so we're not going to construct anything. But I want to I want to put this map this the references up here for you. The, the image on the right that is the ATSERC model. So ATSERC is the storm surge model that the Army Corps and NOAA and everyone else uses to predict storm surge in advance of landfall. This is the ATSERC model. Twenty two hours. This is actually going to run twenty two hours before EMA lands all of Polly Island. So if the track that the storm was on in twenty in uh, on September 29th, it made landfall on the 30th. If the track that the storm was on at this the time this model was run, this is what would happen. This is a very accurate storm surge model. You can see a lot of water. This would estimated a 10 foot seven uh, mean low water flood. So we had three to four feet around the peninsula in the peninsula. I want to draw your attention to how close the Ashley River and the Cooper Rivers are where Bufane and Market Street are, and the five blocks of dry land between the Ashley and Tupelo and Calhoun. This is our future. We had major floods, um, hurricanes passed by the city, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. This is the future. What do we do about it? The photograph on the right, that's Jared Rambo, our friend, the engineer. He's a, he's a great photographer. This is on Wentworth Street, looking down. I think it's at Gadsden. Gadsden. Gas and looking down um, to the to the marina. There is an open connection from the river to this area. If you don't put a structured edge around the peninsula, this is going to occur more and more. And you can't live there. It's just what is going to happen unless you put a structured edge around the edge of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And the, the photograph in the center is just not in Carlson Village on the west side. This is a photo of the Katie took up on the Upper part of the peninsula near Rochelle was like, how did Nicole get this? This was these two pictures on the left were tropical storm Nicole, which was early November. So a small hurricane is what could have come at us with the blue image. And we have the two pictures of showing water in the city with just a little tropical storm. 14, 10, 8 inches of sea level rise, this occurs more often. So process here is the Army Corps. You know, well, they're going to come in and they're going to build us this ugly gray wall. No one wants this. And we've already told them, no, thank you. Let me be very clear. This is not the Army Corps' rendering. This was someone's imagination of what the Army Corps is here to do. <laughs> Nothing has been designed, not even this. But people got ahead of them and said, well, be careful. This is what's going to happen. There is no way this will happen. So let's just be very clear here. This will not happen. This will happen if you design after a hurricane storm surge event because then you're going to rush to get it fixed. But if you have time and you do sensitive design, what is wrong with this? So look at the bottom, the image in the, in the bottom. That's Joe Roddy Waterfront Park with a bin wall as the structure that protects us from storm surge. It is a landscaped, sort of meandering kind of thing with a walkway on top of it. We know that Joe Roddy and others said, let's build for the city, a walkway around the peninsula, just like the low battery. So we have a low battery functioning as a storm surge structure, a tower control structure. Why not try to take this federal money to help us design something that protects the city of Charleston? So, coming back to this process, we are now in negotiations with the Army Corps of Engineers to set up a design agreement to move into the next phase, the PED phase, pre-construction engineering design. That cannot start until that design agreement is negotiated by the mayor, signed by the mayor, approved by city council, reviewed by city council. So there's a lot of control here, but we've already told the Army Corps from the top levels in Washington to our commander here that we are going to put some very important things in the design agreement so we don't get those ugly things I showed on the previous <laughs> slide, but we get something like this. And then we have to deliver, right? So there's a long way to go here. And then after we design it, only then would we go to construction. And there would be another decision by the mayor and the council and the court to do that. 
So there's a lot of work ahead of us, really important work, but we have this opportunity to try to, to try to do this. And it's an important thing. It's eight hundred million dollars for rural health. So sorry for that, but that's just really important to explain where we are. We are uh, in, the, in the process of developing a comprehensive integrated water plan. Thank you to the city council um, for funding that for us. The team has been busy really since, since September of 2022. They're here this week. Some of our local, most of our local, some of are from Louisiana um, and elsewhere. They're helping us do this. Uh, we will have uh, this week various meetings with members of the city council and environmental groups and LAMSI. Rose want things. This is what they're doing. Still gathering information. That's underway. We anticipate a draft report again, as I said before, in September or October 2022. Everyone will have a chance to look and comment and suggest improvements, and then final report in December of 2023. So that's that's pretty good. Um, just want to make you all aware. So the comprehensive plan set up a vision for the city to to try to move to a lot of things, but one of the things is to move to elevation-based zoning. So make water elevation and land elevation a huge consideration for how you how and where you develop. The comprehensive plan is in some ways the carrot. Encourage the developers and the people to do that. The zoning ordinance is the stick. Require them to do that. Um, city planning for the vision, there will be here. They are hiring a consultant to help us um, develop this zone, this elevation-based zoning ordinance, and it'll, it'll change a lot of other things too. We actually, as I heard last night, um, I think Councilman Seekin said something like we're walk, working off of the 1964 um, zoning ordinance. It's something like this. It's really old it's what old. we're doing. So it's really old. So we need to update it because sea level rise is happening and we're building a lot. Um, Two final things. The, the Rosemont Resilience Plan, City Council funded a resilience plan for the community of Rosemont. It's an environmental justice community up on the east, western side of the peninsula. Very important. They're part of the Army Corps project, but they're, they're um, not going to be behind the wall. The Army Corps in the project would in theory elevate their homes. The community doesn't really like that idea, and there are reasons for that. So uh, the city with the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities and other stakeholders are going to do a resilience plan with them. We're going to kick that off. So, Lancy, they got a $300,000 grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to make this a really comprehensive plan. So, it's city money and their money, and we're doing it with them. And that should probably take a year. But this is important work. We have environmental justice considerations. And I want to talk, I mentioned this before, but over the summer, we have updated the city's flooding and sea level rise strategy. Um, the last version was sort of written in the end of 2018, published in 2019. When I got here, it's like, man, the city's been doing, it's done a whole lot more than what was in there. And so this is no longer a PDF, a static PDF. This is an online document. Um, and I'm going to work with it over here. Um, we had an intern, a great College of Charleston intern, uh, grad student, help us do this. And what this is meant to do is to, set forth the strategic vision of how we're going to do this and the key factor here the key change or improvement here is we are now explicitly stating within the policy according to NOAA and other federal agencies that we should assume 14 to 18 inches of sea level rise by 2050. the previous iteration of the sea level rise strategy <coughs> said two to four feet by 2070. that's a hard planning that's a big difference so we try to make that more exact NOAA and most federal agencies are fairly confident given the convergence of all the models that they run for the southeastern U.S., 14 inches, 18 inches is a likely future. So this is part of the strategy and now it guides a lot of city policy. But one of the challenges that, we, that I noticed when I came on board, and it was a huge criticism, and it's a criticism here in every city, so it's not just Charleston, is the city doesn't communicate what it's doing. You all know this, and I can say this as a former outsider, now insider, the city is doing and has been doing a lot. So this is also a communication strategy. There are probably 110 or 120 printed pages if you would print this out. If you don't want to do that. You want to use this online. And um, so you just work through here. You can see how we're doing this. There is just a bunch of information. Here's the 14 to 18 inches. The city had already developed of the city already developed really good tools. Our GS department is just wonderful. 
And so there's all these links in here, and it's just in the document now that we can, we're collating um, this information that is already existing and putting it, making it accessible to you. So um, these are just really, there's a lot of things in here, and um, positive flooding, events, putting signs first. Um, we have a big chapter on land use. You all know that the city comprehensive plan is here. This is all going to be available to you. It's, it's loading. Um, it's slow, so that's okay. Um, I'm slow, but anyway, um, this is all here for us. It follows the guidelines of the former or the previous flooding and sea level rise strategy. It collates and puts together a whole lot more information from city sources, but other sources. So this is a comprehensive look at how the city is going to stay here in the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years. There's a lot of really good work going on. Um, reason this was updated, you want to talk about a goofy little thing. When I started, a bond raider from New York called and said, hey, I'm looking at your sea level rise strategy. It looks good. Are you doing all of that? And I looked at him and said, well, you know, I didn't talk to him. He left this message. We want to talk to you about this, he said. And I said, well, we've done, we've done a lot more. This thing needs to be updated. And I talked to the CFO, Amy Wharton, and she said, is it updated? And I said, no, it's not updated. Can you get it updated? Because we don't want to talk to a bond reader because those are basis points on the cost of our debt. So there's a financial reason why people we should have this information out because the city is doing a whole bunch of really good things and it's here for you all. You're, you're going to get this as soon as the mayor gives the green light, we'll give it to council and then we'll go from there. And this, this should, it's ready to go. It should be out there in the next month. And we can update it on the fly. So if you have improvements, call us. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Any uh, questions uh, for Dale with all that update? See you. Anybody? Thank you, Dale. Um, yeah, please run off and um, work on the Rose Mountain. Now that includes um, Bridge Point as well. The bridge Point, yeah, the bridge, yeah. bridge View apartments on Bridge View, mm -hmm. not Bridge Point. Bridge mm -hmm. View as well. So thank you all. Thank, thank you for that excellent update. And um, next, we're going to uh, call on Katie McCain to give us an update on the uh, Climate Action Plan. The microphones always remind me how short I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, I sent out, uh, and as you all know, we passed our climate action plan back in May 2021. So we're about a year and a half into implementation. It's Remember, it's a five-year plan, so we still have some time to go. There are certainly some actions that we haven't started working on yet that are, that are in line. But I wanted to just give an update on our progress, and I've been tallying some numbers. So this is just progress as of the end of December that I'll run through with you. You do have the document, so I, I won't go through it in, in uh, detail, but I would like to cover a couple of the highlights from each section. So in our waste category, our, our big programs, he, uh, program efforts here have been the composting program and the mattress recycling program. So you can see that there are tons of carbon dioxide equivalent eliminated from both of these programs, more so in the composting, which is normal because that uh, is program that food waste obviously produces methane, which is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So we saw some great results from these programs. In the transportation section, we have our new bike share program that started in May. So we have uh, this is data from that program. And, uh, and I did update this on this slide, but uh, the number that was given on the draft was incorrectly reported as tons when it was actually pounds. So thank you, Mark, for looking at that with a fine tooth comb. And I, I, I will update that. I'll also mention this is a draft, so I'm hoping to publish the final uh, progress report tomorrow. So if we have any changes or updates or any additions y'all think would be helpful for clarity, please let me know. As you all know, we, we did achieve that $7 million low line grant. In our grant application, we actually identified that this project would reduce 120 million less vehicle miles traveled over the lifetime of that project. So that's, that's a pretty exciting impact for our transportation greenhouse gases. 
Our leaf blower fleet is already transitioning to electric. Over 25% have been converted, and we did receive funding in the budget to convert the rest of it. So that you can see the numbers are pretty high for that, and that's just 20, 2022 AD metric ton. Yeah. Can I interrupt you before you yeah. go too far? The low line grant, is that the life of the project? Did you guys calculate that 50 years? What was it, you know? I do not know what the term for that, but it said lifetime in the grant application. Okay. Uh, I can look that look that look into that more for you if you'd like. And then we also have some data on our employee commute. So with our new our new telework policy allowing a telecommute policy allowing two remote days, we've seen over seven thousand remote staff work days in twenty twenty two, and that eliminated uh, nine, over ninety metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent from employee commute. So that's that's a really great start. That number could certainly increase as as we consider any new modifications to that ordinance in our carbon sink sector our charleston rainproof mini grant program in, has installed 37 rain gardens so far and we've calculated that has diverted over 750 gallons of stormwater from the central stormwater system and infiltrated into the ground instead so that's pretty exciting that's from two rounds of mini grants we did not receive funding for the mini grant program this year. I'll talk more about that later. So we are seeking donations and other types of funding so we could still implement that grant program this fall. Through our, through our buyouts and through some through a conservation easement, we have preserved as permanent green space over a hundred acres of land. So that's pretty exciting. So that land is not only absorbing water, but it's also absorbing carbon. Uh, and a lot of that will be is design is coming up and we have some funding from NIFWIF grants that will be designing some really intricate rain gardens and designs for these properties for buyouts. We saw over 1,300 trees planted on public property last year. So that includes anything the Parks Department would plant in parks on new city construction and also on the right of way where new development would, would plant trees. And then our adopted drain program, we've got 384 drains adopted so far, so we are looking to increase that in the next year. When we look at buildings, we had a couple big wins, so the Board of Arch Architectural Review now encourages solar permits on, in the historic district. They created a policy statement that allows designers to see exactly what they're looking for. I imagine this will have some updates uh, as solar becomes more prevalent, but it's a really great start. We are also, our Capital Projects Division is looking at adding solar to all of our new capital projects, and specifically there are two that we are looking at, a fire station on Johns Island and our new public service and safety operations center. And then, of course, all of our new city construction, we are looking to have EV ready infrastructure in that too. And we've actually started doing that already. So, for example, the Charleston Tech Center garage already has EV ready infrastructure in it, which will make it a lot easier to install some stations we just got funding for. So we are also making a lot of progress to expand electric vehicle infrastructure citywide, and I'll talk more about that in a moment too. We also made progress on our education and community engagement part of the plan. So our climate ambassador program has inspired over a thousand people to take climate action, so that's exciting. We had our electric lawn care expo where we reached over 150 residents last April. And then we were out at the Charleston, the West Ashley Farmers Market, uh, talking with about 500 residents about the composting program and encouraging folks to participate. So that's exciting. We also created this past year, we started executing a monthly communication campaign. And this is actually in partnership with Christine at MUSC, the College of Charleston and Charleston County Sustainability. So we've been collaborating together as a network to focus on one specific call to action and subject each month. So for example, January was energy efficiency, February is composting. Uh, and we try to coordinate events and programming around each of those topics and have one specific call to action each month. So uh, all that will hopefully be updated and improved as we, as we uh, look to, as we add a new communications and community engagement manager. But, uh, we did start that this year and of course we have had a lot of volunteers that have helped uh, tremendously over the years so those are really the highlights i wanted to jump into some of our priorities for this year based on the the progress report and if there are items you feel like are missing or should be less of a priority i welcome your input on this so 
One of our main priorities is expanding our composting program. So we did get budget approval. Thank you to Mayor Teckenberg and City Council to maintain our existing compost program on the three sites and add three additional sites. So we're in the process of planning for those new sites where they are and reaching out to community members for our input. We are also planning to host about five workshops where we around these new sites uh, to help train residents and give them some free compost bins and bin liners to help them get started in composting. So those two announcements should be coming out in the next month. We are also still collaborating with other regional governments to add new partners. So we are talking with the city uh, of North Charleston and Mount Pleasant right now about them hosting drop sites in the program and, and joining it to expand reach region wide even further. If you remember, we added Charleston County and Folly Beach in the fall, and that's been a great success. We also have grant funding to pilot vendor composting at both of our farmers markets this year. So that is something I'm working really closely with our farmers market manager on how we execute that. We are seeking some volunteers to help uh, make that possible. And then when the four things are done, we'll move on to try to create a sponsorship program. There are lots of businesses and organizations that strongly support sustainability work in Charleston that are asking how can we help. So we would like to create a package where we could say, hey, could you host a job site at your, at your business uh, and pay for that? And here's the approximate cost and how it would work. So we'll try to put that together uh, probably Q2. And then in the fall, we'll be looking to organize a pumpkin smash potentially at a farmer's market and have more options for pumpkin composting as we were over uh, indulged with pumpkins this fall. So uh, trying to plan for that better next year. So that's just composting. So another huge priority is electric vehicles and associated infrastructure. So we are looking to pilot our first electric vehicles in our fleet this year, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and of course, we'll need to do some education with city staff to help deploy those vehicles and ensure that they are charged appropriately. We are also working on starting a, an official fleet transition plan this year, and I uh, believe we secured funding with the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant where we can pay for that. So working out those details with budget and our grants management is happening now. That program also requires some plans to be created, so there are some grant reporting requirements for it, but it is not an official giant grant application, which is nice. Once we have that fleet transition plan, then we can go after some of the really large federal grant opportunities to implement that plan, pay for vehicles, save us a bunch of money, and hopefully get us caught up on our fleet replacement plans, because right now we just don't have enough funding uh, to cover all the, the vehicles that are supposed to be replaced each year, and we're, we're still playing catch up. So with the EV infrastructure, we, have, we did get funding to upgrade the eight existing stations to dual ports, so that means we'll have 16 stations in our city garages. We also got some funding to in, uh, install stations at the tech center garage, as I think I mentioned. We will also be creating an EV parking policy to pair with that, so we'll make sure that as we add requirements to these new network stations, we have them you know, written down and posted appropriately. We are also working uh, under the leadership of the BCD COG, so thank you Catherine and Kyle has been a huge help to create a regional electric vehicle infrastructure plan. So how do we leverage our regional resources to have electric vehicle infrastructure uh, all over the region and uh, appropriately plan for that? So the idea is we're in the planning process right now, anyone is welcome to participate in that process. And the idea is then we would take that plan and then also go after a large federal grant to pay to implement that plan. A lot of these large federal grants coming out of the IRA have no match required. So uh, pretty excited we got that new uh, grants uh, writer persons who can help us uh, expand capacity to apply for some of these grants. I believe this one, the COG has actually interested in managing this one, which would be even better for us. Um, so that's exciting. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Another question. Um, in the report, it said replace exi the existing eight charging stations. Here it just says upgrade them. Sorry. What was wrong? I, mean, it doesn't matter. I was just wondering what was wrong, what happened, what was wrong with them, and why did they need to be replaced or upgraded? They're going to be, they're going to be replaced. So the eight stations were installed back in 2009, and they're non-networked. So that means we can't charge any money for them. We can't limit how long people stay in the parking spot. We can't reserve any for fleet use that in the evening. So we're very limited with the existing stations. They, they break constantly. And honestly, a lot of the equipment is really hard to find because it's so old. It's such old technology. 
So there's a chance that we could save some of those and use them in a, just for fleet operations. So we'll consider that as we move forward. Uh, typically, non-networked are a lot better for fleet operations than for public operations. So, so yeah, it will be replaced. Uh, great, thank you for that. All right, and then this last one, we actually have an agenda. I think we'll talk more about it, but uh, we are, of course, working on the Make Ready Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Policy that the community has reviewed a few times in the past. Okay, so those are two big topic areas, and here's a couple other smaller ones that we're also working on. Um, so we will be updating, this is our year to update our greenhouse gas inventory, so we do it every four years. Stuart has already volunteered to help manage that process, so we'll be doing it for the 2022 data, which is exciting. And we will also be using, for transportation, we'll be using the Google, Google data. Um, in the past, we've used data from COG, and COG gets their data from putting those rubber strips down on the road. And it's been proven that the Google data, which is looking at everything, including cell phones, uh, is probably more accurate. And they've actually been doing a lot of research. So we'll be doing that. And since we're big, we'll be doing that, we will add a statement because if you're going to compare 2022 to 2018, we need to go back and possibly use Google data from 2018, which when looking at it, it increases the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we thought we had by a certain amount. Um, so it comes back to about 0.38 metric tons per person. That's the difference. But we felt we needed to be transparent. So when we do that, there'll be an addendum on the other report to let everyone know that we're doing that. And you should be able to start um, pretty soon uh, on doing the uh, analysis. Great. Thank is you that, so much. Is that done in house or did you get a consultant? No, we, we do it. In house, we belong to an organization called ICLE, which is an international group. And what the, one of the reasons we belong to ICLE is because we could use their algorithms. So when we put in a, a certain amount of kilowatts per, um, let's say for residential, it'll be, and, and we're using factor scales that we help create based on where we get our electricity from. So if, we're, if we uh, were in other parts of the country, we might be getting 40% uh, from coal, but et cetera. So one of the major differences between 2002 and 2018 is the factor set. In 2002, we were getting 40% of our electricity from coal. In 2018, it reduced to, uh, to 19%. So all those things in, in, taken into consideration, they have the algorithms. We just put in that information, and we actually get a number. So it's really neat. And then we rely on people like Danny um, and others to provide data uh, yeah, to us. <laughs> one item on the plan, this is, you know, Dale said, talked about the communication. So on the, under the plant and protect tree canopy, you know, we wouldn't revamp the non-standard service one, which I see crazy in the back, shaking her head. So we spent a lot of time on that. That was actually an offset of tree agreement we created a committee and so there's a concept in there where you will do more undergrounding of electric facilities conceptually it's a school it's a high scoring item so what it should do is it should allow for uh, undergrounding projects to proceed maybe shorter linear projects but also once it's underground there's it's a tree corner right it's green space so connect the dots. That's actually the reason. That's to me. That's a great bet. That ought to be probably part of the report. I mean, I know it's a, a there's a list that's growing, but we should get to execution and selection of projects. But part of that is you should end up with more trees. It's a small piece, but I think it's the communication piece. People I think missed. They forgot about all the stuff that went into getting all that stuff done. Credit to the mayor and the council for doing that. Well, can I say something? Since you brought that up, it would be great if. Um, as sidewalks are being approved and installed or reinstalled, that that undergrounding follows that process because you know they've already got the, the sidewalk dug up. On well, the list. <laughs> but somebody needs to, you know, like review it. <laughs> Can I just follow up really quickly, Danny? Thanks for bringing up the non-standard service agreement, aka underground wiring. 
Um, it might be a good thing for this committee. I get a lot of questions about it, and I got to tell you, I'm not particularly conversant on exactly where we are in the process in terms of what our ordinance, where our ordinance is, the prioritization process, the funding process. So maybe that this would be a good clearinghouse to at least get a report on where we are with that, so we can at least send people to place they can look at and see sort of what. In the end, the question is, is it ever going to happen in my neighborhood, right? Uh, and I think being able to talk intelligently about that rather than saying, well, we're, we're working through it and we'll get back to you would be helpful. Thanks. As I was sitting here, I just got an email about it. So it was timely. <laughs> it's yeah. timely that you no, brought actually, it up. Actually, and I called Danny, is what I did. I'm like, Danny, what, hello, what are we doing? It's a great, it actually, it's a great suggestion. It, it's, it, I mean, literally, there are two programs there's a neighborhood program, which still exists, which was the original program. So that's not. That's not going away. It just takes longer. It's more complex. And there's a there's another program which is which uses existing funding. It's for much more what I would define as like very linear projects, like sidewalks get replaced or a taller a building is going up and there's a conflict. It's, does that qualify? And does that mean you're going to get more trees and better aesthetics? Yeah, it could be. But it's a process though. So that's a yeah fair point. It's a quick update: We have hired first ever project manager who's a hundred percent dedicated to undergrounding and uh, so we will ask him to come to our next meeting he should be kind of up to speed i guess by a long long time and uh give us an update from his perspective i think that'd be a, a, a great he's, idea. he's getting most of the uh we, we've met with him numerous times to share all the institutional knowledge which is great because that's what you need you don't you know, you need other people than just the two of us. Right. Three people know what it's crazy. You I think it's short for what I'm saying is need help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so moving on. So our we are also working with our livability department to figure out how we can make uh, events in the city, both city sponsored events and private events on city property more sustainable and uh, considering we're gonna create a sustainable events manual and also consider some potential requirements for events. You know, should there be a waste margin <coughs> requirement and leave it up to maybe the event to figure out how they divert that. So those will all be uh, discussed this coming spring. And we also did get approval in the budget for a communication and community engagement manager. So this, this person will help not only sustainability but also resilience and emergency management so they'll be split up into three but uh, I know some of my big focuses for that for that new, new position is to improve our communication and our social media presence to community members which involves organizing more frequent public engagement events and trying to encourage folks to help be part of that solution we also want to train a new climate ambassador cohort and get a new presentation out there and then in the past we've had a green business challenge so looking at opportunities how can we bring this back potentially in a different way that requires some less staff, staff capacity in the future it was a huge success in the past uh, but was a, a little bit too demanding for us to continue so that will be a, a communication focus will be strong this year too as i mentioned our mini grant program we usually do in the fall but we did not get funding for it so we are looking for at least five thousand dollars but uh we'd, we'd like ten thousand dollars to be able to do that we, if there are any uh, organizations or businesses that would like to sponsor that program, please let me know. Let's see, we are also planning for renewable energy and a facilities management plan. So renewable energy is, is very challenging to plan for in existing city facilities. We have a lot of challenges, mostly just that we have so many facilities. Many are really small. Many have old roofs and we don't have a roof replacement plan yet. Uh, many have large trees shading them. We have lots in the historic district, which has extra uh, requirements. So planning for renewable energy on existing facilities, we're trying to determine uh, with the CFO and Mayor Tecklenburg how we move forward with that. Do we need some additional capacity? A lot of cities will hire an energy analyst that will focus on renewable energy and, and energy efficiency. So that may be a position that we request in the budget in the future. But we want to make sure all departments are on board with that before we consider that. There are also all kinds, the new renewable energy investment tax credit is really exciting for local government now because we can take it as a direct payment instead of a tax credit and it increased from 30% up to 70%. So we are working with those logistics and trying to determine how we can use that tax credit to our advantage too. 
Let's see, uh, Dale mentioned the zoning code rewrite. As you look through the climate action plan, there are quite a few actions in there that need to be updated that will be part of the zoning code rewrite and considered in that process. So I'll be very involved in that process, but again, planning is leading that. That is a two-year process, so it will be a while before that full plan is written. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Our street tree inventory was funded, so that's really exciting. The Parks Department leaving that. Um, and in the meantime, as the Parks Department starts drafting that RFP, uh, we are collaborating with the Charleston Parks Conservancy, and I see Devin is here today, to, to help increase tree plantings and uh, bring some more volunteer support to watering trees. So I appreciate that partnership. We're also looking at targeting an underserved community every year, uh, and that would happen in November, December, when planting season is right for it. But uh, hopefully, we can get an, an event organized around that. So, so those are those are some of the major priorities. There'll be some other projects that come up, other things we're planning for. But please let me know if you think there's something more uh, pivotal that you think should be a priority this year. I will mention there's a couple of things we are looking for help on, uh, both from either community members or from the general public. We are looking for volunteers to help support composting at the farmers markets that are on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And you can reach out to me uh, if you're interested in helping with any of these. We are also, we have a, an action about testing and piloting super sink plants. So basically plants that absorb a whole lot more carbon than a typical plant and also a whole lot more water. Uh, there's some some varieties of bamboo that do this, for example, but bamboo can also be invasive. So looking for help to research these plants and, and potentially even help planting them and testing them on private property, if that's possible. We are also looking for partnerships to create an urban forestry workforce training program, uh, potentially with local schools, such as our Trident Tech Horticulture Program. So if anyone's interested in helping us partner with that, that would be really helpful. And then there's a few items in the climate action plan that require uh, state advocacy efforts. So these are things that we can't change at the local level, but we can advocate for at the state level, such as updating our energy codes and things like that. So I, mean, I know there's a lot of uh, environmental organizations that are really good at staying on track, uh, up to date with this stuff, if you're interested in helping to support that. So that is my update on the progress and our priorities. Are there any thoughts, comments, suggestions? That's quite a list. I, I did want to add one thanks and a note. Uh, thanks to Dominion for working with us to uh, come up with our streetlight replacement uh, program and the Cobra uh, streetlights, which are most of them in, off the peninsula. And um, we're converting them to LEDs. They've just started, I understand. Outer West Ashley are going to be working their way in. And a uh, difference in the number of metric tons of carbon dioxide saved, I, I forget the number, but it's substantial. Do you remember what that is? It's it's a big number, much bigger than uh, these other initiatives. So it's it's huge for this year that we're going to make that conversion and save a lot of energy as well. Danny? No, it's part of it. It's at least half the energy savings. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some other really good features. I think as we get into it, I think it's just I think that's that's just I think the beginning. I think there are other opportunities. Well, so we need step one first. And also financially, it's yeah, it exactly. reduces the city's yeah. electric bill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, if you're not familiar, we did pass an agreement with the union to, to transition those lights in the fall. So that's exciting. That will happen. I'll also share. Um, <laughs> there aren't specific projects dedicated to this yet, but. There was budget approval for a new transportation planner in the planning department and a new transportation project manager in the trans, uh, traffic and transportation department. And those two together will be working on implementing the people pedal plan. So we hope to see some great progress on those uh, in the upcoming year, as soon as we can get those positions hired too. So. Rick? Uh, I'm completely ignorant about this, but. Um, Speaking about LED lights, and so talking about the telephone poles and that sort of thing, which is, which is really great. But do we have any feel? I mean, this may be related more to communications and public engagement than anything else, not that we need to do this because we're talking about people's homes. But do we have any feel about how many people actually use LED in their homes versus, I mean, can you not can you buy the old fashioned stuff anymore or is it all gone? Uh, you just replace some lights on a chandelier with yeah. LED. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the lights that are available in the market are 
all LED. I mean, there's no issue here. I, I mean, in the future, it's going to be everybody's going to be using them whether or not they like to or not. I think you can still buy. You can. Yeah, you can still buy fluorescent. Okay, I didn't know. If and they still are on. more affordable you, 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 Can you imagine that the, the savings? I don't know how you document that. You know. um, so I could probably go through some some math, but we, I mean, no. literally that's part of it. It's a pretty effective way in the energy efficiency program. Yeah. Across, we used to give, used to be a couple of iterations, but it was, you know, it was incandescence and then it, it moved to fluorescence and right. now to LEDs, but right. you literally would like, Incentives for people to convert over. Yeah, they're, just, they're in the middle every month. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I just was curious whether or not that's something that we can account, that we can actually account for, whether or not we're responsible for making it happen or not. I mean, it's still affecting the carbon footprint. I would think. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm just sure. gonna I'm just gonna add. I think when we do the greenhouse gas emissions, we're we're gonna see that. And okay. What we did, Katie and I, we said okay uh, to help uh, the the idea of working remotely. We looked at, we did a very quick down and dirty uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the year of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we thought that residential would go like that. And it actually went down a little bit. And when I, you and I talked and uh, Danny said, it's probably people going out and buying more efficient uh, appliances and LEDs. And just to add to that, when I did, the presentations for the climate action plan, part of the presentation would always ask, because we had that list at the end, how many of you are using LEDs? And almost every hand went up. Went up. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Marilyn? Yes, yeah, Scott. In terms of seeking assistance, item number four, um, I'm proxy here today for Bailey Vincent, who is our full-time state lobbyist, which is why she's not here today. Um, we have a business advocacy committee that reviews these kinds of state issues to determine whether they become a chamber position that she lobbies. Um, if you have a list of the items that you'd like for us to review to see whether they would become a, a chamber lobby position, we'd be happy to run that through the business advocacy committee to see whether we would add it to the list of things that she's lobbying every day. So, so right. just send us that list and we'll run it through our process. That'd be terrific. And I would put, put a footnote on that. We create a annual legislative um, agenda every year. That process begins in August, uh, and then ultimately results in a published position piece that we republish and print out and hand out uh, by December of every year. So I would also invite you all to, whether it's this kind of an issue or any kind of an issue, to try and let us know by August of every year if there's something that you'd like for us to consider putting on the next year's legislative agenda so so it's not only an ask now for this it's also an alert you should think of us anything that you want to change in state law to run through the process to see whether it can become a part of our next year's legislative agenda great thank you great that's great offer christine um likewise the sierra club also has a lobbyist and um, we can do exactly the same thing um, so we're getting an update actually tonight from our lobbyist um, at an online meeting so, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something we can help with. And uh, incentives for Dominion, I wanted to mention that. Um, there are incentives for lighting. Um, the, the form is really easy to fill out. Um, so, yeah, anybody who changes lighting can, um, you know, apply for it. Before you buy the product. <laughs> Great. Okay, in the interest of time, we're running a little behind. If you have any comment, more comments on this, please feel free to call me or uh, email me. And let's jump to our last topic. So, as you know, we've talked about this at our last, uh, uh, a few of our last meetings, uh, the Make Ready Code. And at our last meeting, y'all recommended that we go ahead and draft a code for your review and also continuing to reach out with the development community. So, Bailey and the Chamber and Scott have been really helpful. Well, we've had three meetings with the development community already, and then we're uh, going to try to improve this draft and get it out to hundreds of people in the development community for their feedback, and also uh, anyone from the general public, too, who would like to comment. So I would like to introduce my sustainability intern, Aspen Caffey, who will actually take you through this code. Uh, again, this is a draft, and we welcome your feedback. You are certainly welcome to email us comments, too, uh, as we probably won't be able to discuss too much today. but. Uh, Aspen. Aspen. Hey. 
Hi, um, I haven't met a lot of you, but I'm Aspen. <laughs> Thank you. And I am going to go over the code with you. So, right. first thing, um, and I apologize if I'm looking at my notes a lot. I'm not going to get through everything if I don't. Um, so first, our main goal with this ordinance is to promote increased charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, which supports uh, the growth of the EV industry. Um, EV use is on the rise nationally and in South Carolina. Um, between 2020 and 2021, we had almost a 70% increase in EV registrations in the state. Um, but one of the main hurdles, why don't you want? one of the main hurdles is a lack of charging infrastructure. So that's what this um, ordinance hopes to address. We're good now. <laughs> All right, a couple of the benefits of introducing this code now um, is that, as I mentioned, it helps uh, foster EV growth. Um, it also prepares for an exponential rise in EV use. Um, and it saves us <laughs> up to 70 or 80 percent um, when we introduce uh, this infrastructure in new construction rather than retrofitting. As you can see in the chart on the right, there's a lot of savings. Um, and just to reiterate, our main goal here is to be ready. All right, into some of the infrastructure details. There are three levels of charging. First, we have level one, um, also known as trickle charging. Um, it's not adequate for our requirements. We're looking for level two or above. Level two is the most common you're gonna see. Um, it's an outlet that's similar to your dryer outlet at home. Um, and it's the minimum requirement for our code. Then we have level three DC fast charging, which goes above and beyond our code. And then there are also three different types of installation requirements. So we have requirements for each of these in our code. Um, first, we have EV capable. This is kind of the simplest requirement. You just have to have the panel capacity and conduit from the panel to the parking space. Um, these spaces are not ready to use by an electric vehicle. Um, this is a very low cost, uh, simple installation. Um, then we have EV ready, which is kind of the main goal of our uh, code right now. Um, so you have to have all those EV capable requirements, and then you just have to have that wiring installed with termination and a junction box or an outlet at the space. Um, these spaces can be used by drivers if they have a portable charger, but they're not considered fully installed. Um, then we have the EV installed, um, which has all of those EV ready requirements and just the fully connected level two charger or a DC fast charger if the owner wished to install that. Um, these spaces are ready to charge any EV. And we have more limited requirements of those in the code right now. Um, just a little bit of information on investment in the state. So we had a South Carolina executive order uh, last year that um, started the South Carolina EV Economic Development Initiative. Um, they also hired um, like an official EV liaison in our state <coughs> um, to focus on EV growth in our state. And they want to promote um, growth of the EV workforce and support jobs there. We also have all of these companies investing lots in our state and facilities for things like uh, EV manufacturing and design, uh, battery production, and that comes to more than $2 billion investment. And we'll see that the fruit of that in the coming years. And then we also have a couple incentives examples here. Uh, the Berkeley Electric Cooperative is investing in installation of some charging stations in Berkeley, Dorchester, and Charleston counties. Um, Duke Energy is investing in DC fast charger installation along highways and interstates in their territories. And then we have this tax credit um, that you can't yeah, my see. Yeah, computer just died, so. Oh, no. <laughs> right. Well, we have a tax credit available too for installation of uh, EV infrastructure. All right, moving on to the actual code. Um, I won't go through everything because you've been sent a copy of this and hopefully you have a chance to look over it and you can also do that on your time. Um, but first we have the applicability. So this code applies 
to all new construction and to um, retrofits of past installations um, that affect the parking. <laughs> The chart, so like, <laughs> that's okay. Everyone has the chart okay. in their you look out. the chart, and then there's also an example of what some example projects should be recorded. So, right now, we're looking at the chart. Um, this is a drop, these numbers, um, these numbers are very much in a draft state. Um, this chart and the categories and the numbers are based on other codes. They're based on our parking code. Um, as you can see, it's separated by land use, and that's consistent with our city of Charleston parking code. It's also separated by the capable, ready, and install requirements um, because those are, are separate requirements in our code. Um, so if you had requirements in multiple categories, one space would not fulfill, um, would not fulfill multiple requirements. Um, there's kind of a focus on bigger projects in this code. Um, as you can see, like in office and retail, we only have these requirements for projects with greater than 25 parking spaces as of now, because um, our goal is really to focus on bigger projects um, and also on residential projects of all sizes. Um, a couple of details we can look at. So for single family, we're hoping to have just one EV ready space across the board so that um, owners can choose to install those later. Um, for multifamily, we're really hoping, hoping to get um, at least like one or two EV installed spaces in those places so that there's no later fight with like HOAs and trying to find funding to install those so that people living in those communities can have that available. Um, for affordable housing, we have a much lower requirement than in these other categories because there's less of a demand there now, but we also don't want to disadvantage those areas, so we want to have them at least be capable. Capable is also the cheapest form of installment, so it keeps those projects low budget. Um, for accommodations, um, this is just following a trend that we already are seeing in uh, EV installation in hotels. So this is really just supporting that. Um, there's a demand there, it's already happening. We're just trying to support that. For public parking facilities, those requirements are a little bit higher because parking is their whole goal. Um, and we want to lead by example by investing in EV installation in our public parking facilities. Great. Now, if you want to look at um, the example page that you have. Again, these numbers are subject to change, subject to your feedback, um, but this is just to show you kind of how the calculations would work. Um, I won't go through all of these super detailed, but just to look at the first one, we have a mixed use residential and office project with 100 residential units and 20,000 square feet of office. Um, this not on financial is just something that's in the parking code. It's not really relevant right now. Um, so the total parking spaces required for the parking code for that project would be 184 spaces. Um, we don't have an EV capable requirement for either the mixed use uh, for the residential or the office. We do have an EV ready requirement and an EV installed requirement for both as of now. So you would do the calculations um, for those projects separately um, and then you would add them together. And what we want to do is add them together first and then round just as a little detail doesn't really apply to this example, but so that would equal 22 total spaces um, in the EV ready category and seven in the EV installed. And again, just to show you that they're not, that the requirements are separate, um, you would have nine <laughs> total spaces affected. Um, and then you can see affordable housing. Um, there is, this is a mixed use affordable housing project, um, and there is a capable requirement there because the capable is for the affordable housing, and then the ready and the installed apply to that office. And then just affordable housing alone, you can see that's a very low requirement. Um, and we kind of already went over all of these, so I won't go into them super detailed again. Um, all right. And then you would be seeing some lovely pictures that we took at our last meeting if we have the slides up, but we've been meeting with the development community for a while with the help of the Chamber of Commerce. 
um, just to get feedback and edit the code. Our last meeting uh, last week was the first time we actually had a draft code to go over. And I we reviewed that and I have some edits um, in my mind based on that. Um, and that's kind of what we're hoping to do today is get some feedback and make some edits from that. I think that's pretty much it. Did you have anything to add? Okay. Um, Catherine, good any job. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> any questions for Aspen or uh, Christine? Um, are hospitals included in this? Is that cool? Um, no, no, not right now. So we we exchange that there. There is a provision for the office, but in our parking, we follow the parking code uh, as a recommendation from our zoning administrator for clarity. So right now, we're there's just a couple primary uses. And the parking code is there's way more categories. We kind of edited it down a little bit, but I imagine we could put more categories in if needed. Do you remember if you saw a hospital? Is there there's any a, yeah, separate there's a hospital. land use for a hospital? Okay. Yeah. So if we wanted to include it, we could add it. Yeah, I'll make a note to look into that. I, I will also throw in though that uh, we are updating the zoning code. So we're trying to get this passed before we update the zoning code because we know that's going to take two years. So whatever we get past this year, we will be updating in the next two years anyway. But we can always add hospitals then and make it more strict if, if we feel like that's important to add that time. So well, we could add in that. Just a simple, again, simple question. Single family home, one unit, two parking spots are required, one unit dedicated to something um, to the EV ready requirements. Does this apply to developments of single family homes as well as if I were just to build a house on my one acre of property? So it applies to all single family homes regardless. This applies whether it's a development being built or an individual home being built. Yes. Right? Okay. Thank you both. Yeah, right. Okay. I'll just just so Katie. Um, Ask when you can check the math, but I think the ratios are, are I mean, it should be. Think about it, but you probably model it after other ordinances, but yeah, exactly. So basically, one one for every 10 spots, mm -hmm. and then on the, on the ready, uh, uh, yeah, one out of 25, one out of 10 is mm -hmm. probably the right number. And never do more, always do more than always do at least two, yeah, yeah, and that makes it makes it, yeah, I mean. It, the challenge is this is more things to be built. The challenge is there are plenty of places to convert that don't have access that are expensive. So why not spend the dollars up front for something that is essentially inevitable? Yeah, there's we have a lot four. of savings on that too. We have four, we have four spots at work. Uh, Westy and I are gonna fight over this point. We're, we're almost done. We, we're actually, we just ordered six more. So even at our small location, we're gonna outpace pretty quick, so we'll have to basically 10 spots. We're not in the city of Charleston, we're in the North Charleston, mm -hmm. we're out of it. Yeah. So we get adoption, and you could argue our adoption might be a little quicker than everybody else, mm -hmm. but, but I don't think it is. I think we represent the more yeah. people. Um, one thing we specifically wanted to get some feedback on was the install requirements. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on this? And now, um, given the time of a little bit, everyone please um, uh, send Aspen and Katie any comments you may have or any recommendations. And, uh, and, and I would say I think we're doing a pretty robust job of, uh, with the chamber of uh, you know consulting the build, home builders and construction trades. So once we we get this. Uh, ordinance finalized, maybe it's something that the Council of Governments could help us share with the other local jurisdictions as a, you know, example of something that we could try to do community-wide rather than just in the city of Charleston. You did, you did that. You after did that. The, well, after your last meeting, we have a, a, a forum where we have all the players from the region come in and, and a bunch of them. Katie came and spoke and shared everything the city was doing to try and encourage the other jurisdictions to follow suit. And um, the stormwater management committee is going to be also on their agenda talking about the pushing that out the drain program. So, oh, great. So we will do that. Thank you.
I think you know the county created a similar committee like this, the Resilience and Sustainability Advisory Committee. Um, and uh, we actually had our first meeting last week. So, oh, great. Yeah, so are you serving on that? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Danny? Yeah, just um, the, big, the big gap at the end of the day is that level two charging. And so for the, for the areas that we serve, we know there are 24% of our customers live in multifamily. Okay. So that's 24% of the market probably doesn't have an EV charger access. And they might have one at work, but probably not. So that's a huge void that I think we, that, that, I mean, going forward, I, mean, I don't think you're going to, you're going to knock it out. It's gradualism, right? But, we, right? but that's an important piece that you literally are taking people out of the market that don't have a chance to charge your car where they live to dwell. So that's got that to me that starts to address it. Right? We've got some strategies around that too. But it's a pretty big. It's, you're taking a fourth of the people and saying, "Hey, you can't have an EV." Thank you again, Asma. Great work. Good work. So, uh, given the time has passed, uh, we only have left a uh, um, citizen of public comment period. Would any yeah. citizens like to make a comment? Did anybody sign up online? Sign up for their job. Yeah. Would anybody here like to join us? Please come forward, state your name and address, and we at the yeah. microphone, please. Yeah, so it'll we'll be on the record. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Bell Knowles, Fourth Great Registry, City of Charleston. Um, I bring news from Mount Pleasant. Uh, the mayor has proposed a green committee um, and it's not unanimous among council that this is necessity or a good idea. So I thought a good advocacy uh, outreach effort from y'all would be reaching out to Mount Pleasant Council saying this has been a helpful body you know, getting these environmental things to Maine Council. Um, and right now the focus is proposed to be on conservation and just green space and maybe mentioning that having other environmental Factors be a part of this committee. I think that'd be helpful. Um, and also, the council is discussing a green building ordinance um, in terms of sort of low impact development. Um, I know that we have the new zoning codes coming up, um, but in the same spirit as the EV uh, codes, we want to get that ASAP. Um, the impact of a year or two years of development that doesn't have green building incentives baked in, pretty large. So I'm just raising the possibility. Of looking into having some green building incentives like trust and rises or something of that nature uh, be considered um, before the comprehensive zoning goes are done. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for being with us and uh, commission committee members, thank you for your participation. Everybody who's here today, it was uh, terrific to see you all. I wish everyone a great 2023. As you've heard, um, there are a lot of things we're working on and any uh, suggestions, comments along the way, don't wait till the next meeting. If something comes along you wanna share with us, please please reach out to me or Katie uh, or Aspen on this matter. But um, thanks everybody, appreciate Thank it. We're adjourned. Thank you.